How psychedelic drugs produce their therapeutic effects remains an active research question. Many recent studies suggest that the facilitation of brain plasticity may be a key mechanism, but how psychedelic drugs achieve the facilitation of plasticity remains somewhat unclear. Now, researchers working at the University of Helsinki have published a very interesting study which essentially suggests that they have figured out a key mechanism of psychedelic-induced plasticity. So stay tuned and I will walk you through these very exciting results. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala and I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. Now, some of you may remember a video I published around two years ago uh, where I said that, that at this point I'm just waiting for a paper to come up that shows how psilocybin directly binds to the track B receptors. I mean, that would make up a great story. Don't you agree? Looking back at that statement, it seems like I have at least some ability to predict the future, since today we'll be taking a look at a very uh, exciting recent study uh, called Psychedelics Promote Plasticity by Directly Binding to BDNF Receptor Track B. It was published in Nature Neuroscience, a highly regarded top journal. I have to mention that this is a topic close to my heart since I've spent most of my time studying track B signaling induced by psychotropic drugs. So, the paper presents a set of very interesting yet quite controversial findings related to how psychedelic drugs may promote brain plasticity. Decades of research have established that the brain is not set in stone, but instead it remains a plastic organ throughout life. This essentially means that the neurons, which are one of the main cell types that constitute the brain and are responsible for most of its computation, can establish new connections throughout life. Plasticity is particularly high during brain development and in early childhood. This likely accounts for the incredible ability of children to adapt to the outside world, learn new skills and acquire information very effectively. Research has also revealed the existence of so-called critical or sensitive periods of plasticity, which take place at different stages of development and facilitate the learning of critical functions, such as wiring your vision, speech and social skills to match the external environment you grow in. Once these so-called critical periods close, the circuits involved become somewhat stable and remain so throughout the rest of life. Now, as we go into adulthood, plasticity does not entirely disappear, but it is generally thought to decrease. Now, studies published in the past few decades suggest that some drug treatments such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, which are used not only to treat depression but many other conditions, have the ability to facilitate brain plasticity in adulthood. These plasticity-promoting effects have also been linked to rapid-acting antidepressants like ketamine. Previous studies have shown that both traditional and rapid-acting antidepressants facilitate the expression and or release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. BDNF belongs to a family of neurotrophins, or growth factors, which have important roles in signaling cell survival, differentiation and growth. BDNF mediates these effects by acting as the endogenous ligand for track B or TRKB receptors, which then initiate further cellular signaling cascades leading to changes in neural structure and function. 
According to a important line of research, the facilitation of brain plasticity is thought to be very important for the effects of almost all antidepressant drugs. It has been hypothesized, for example, that by facilitating plasticity, these drugs have the ability to help the brain to change. For example, to change away from circuit activity and mental functions that perhaps maintain a cycle of depressive rumination. All of this obviously remains somewhat abstract, but that's that. In recent years, studies have also suggested that psychedelic drugs like psilocybin facilitate neural plasticity, possibly by, again, increasing the expression of PDNF in the brain. This effect, as well as the profound subjective psychedelic experiences, have been strongly associated with the ability of these drugs to bind to the serotonin 2A receptor, also known as 5-HT2A receptor. However, some studies have suggested that the 5-HT2A receptor is not necessary for plasticity, Check out my other video linked here or in the description for an example of such a study. Moreover, another recent study suggested that psychedelics bind to a particular population of intracellular 5-HT2A receptors, which, <clears throat> which drives the plasticity promoting effects. Now, we have this quite interesting new study, which essentially is proposing that instead of psychedelics mediating their therapeutic effects through 5-HT2A receptors, psychedelic drugs would directly bind to track B receptors and thus uh, facilitate mechanisms of plasticity in the brain. If this were the case, it would be potentially possible to create drugs that lack the psychedelic effects but still promote plasticity, since track B receptors are not involved in creating psychedelic experiences. Obviously, many researchers think that the psychedelic experience itself is crucial for the therapeutic outcomes. And you can check my older video where I discuss some of these different aspects of the therapeutic mechanisms of psychedelic drugs. Now, before we start to go through the actual results, let me just say that I won't be going into too much detail here and I'll be skipping many of the parts of the paper because there's just a lot of data and also I'm not an expert in all of these uh, different things. But I'll try to make a kind of a summary conclusion in the, towards the end of this video. So if you kind of, uh, if something goes over your head, uh, watch all the way until the end and maybe you'll get an overall perspective still. Also, I'll try to give out some uh, pointers related to, for example, uh, methodological aspects of some of the experiments, um, things that I would kind of pay attention to when, when I'm reading a scientific study. My intention is not to devalue the hard work that has gone into to creating this, this quite exciting paper, but instead to provide a learning opportunity uh, for you and also to, to highlight the fact that it's often very difficult to interpret uh, scientific uh, findings. The study begins with figure 1, with graph A demonstrating the main finding that psychedelics bind to track B receptors and that LSD binding to track B receptors is impaired by specific mutations in the binding pocket most importantly the tyrosine Y433 to phenylalanine mutation, which is Y433F. Moreover, B shows that psilocybin and fluoxetine compete with LSD binding to track B. In the extended data, the binding affinity of LSD to track B was reported to be similar to its canonical target, the 5-HT2A receptor, while being up to 1,000-fold higher than that of fluoxetine or ketamine. Indeed, the authors have argued that this high affinity binding could mediate the rapid therapeutic effects associated with these drugs. I only wish there was more binding data from more selective 5-HT2A agonists, since LSD is such a dirty, dirty drug. 
one interesting thing you can uh, see from the data is that that lyseride, a uh, non-psychedelic ergoline, is also binding to track B receptors. And this could already be a kind of a candidate drug for something that doesn't produce psychedelic effects, but perhaps facilitates plasticity. Now, going forward, figure 2 presents molecular dynamics simulations of the putative binding bucket for LSD and psilocybin. In the middle of the picture, you can also see a track B dimer with BDNF bound to it. It nicely demonstrates how the suggested binding position for psychedelics is separate inside the transmembrane domain, or in other words, the part of the receptor that sits inside the cellular membrane. Other sets of the data mainly present different things you can pull out from uh, computational modeling, but I am not an expert in this field and, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how reliable these models are, since, to my understanding, the crystal structure uh, of track B remains somewhat undefinitive. We can skip figure 3, since it's just more MD simulations I know very little about. In figure 4, we get to see some more exciting data, suggesting that LSD and psilocybin increase track B dimerization, which is one way of saying the receptor is activated. Again, the tyrosine 433 mutation abolishes these effects. The, the graph E suggests that track B receptor bodies, or track BFC, which hijack extracellular BDNF, abolish the effects of both BDNF and LSD on receptor dimerization. Surprisingly, LSD by itself seems to produce robust dimerization. Indeed, the authors argue that LSD potentiates the effects of low BDNF concentrations on dimerization, as can be seen in graph F. Here the authors propose that psychedelics do not directly activate track B, but their effects on dimerization are dependent on the release of endogenous BDNF, consistent with an allosteric effect. For someone like me, well versed in the dark arts of western blotting, the only real way is the way of the blot. Unfortunately, pretty much the only in vivo phosphorylation data presented is with LSD in extended figure 5. I don't really want to nitpick, but at least the supplementary blots, which show, for example, track B and mTOR phosphorylation, have all the samples of the same condition on one side of the blot, and the other condition is placed on the other side. Now remember folks, you should always alternate your treatment conditions when loading gels, because there's a high risk of seeing false differences comparing samples on the opposite sides of the membrane. And then there are some instances of the infamous vampire's teeth. But then again, you know, there's, there's a lot of other data uh, supporting the idea that psychedelics do bind to track B receptors, so that's that. Now, skipping to figure 6, we are shown that psychedelic-induced neuroplasticity depends on track B and BDNF, but is not dependent on 5-HT2A activation. Photobleaching experiments utilizing GFP-tagged track B suggest that psychedelics increase track B trafficking into dendritic spines, while the effect is again lost in the tyrosine-433 mutants. Moreover, spinogenesis experiments show that LSD and psilocybin increase spinogenesis. But again, the receptor mutation abolishes this effect. The effect of LSD on spinogenesis, however, is still there after the application of M00907, a drug also known as volinanserin, a 5-HT2A antagonist, suggesting that these effects of LSD are not dependent on 5-HT2A receptors. These findings are somewhat controversial, since there are also some studies showing that volinanserin can block the dendritic plasticity induced by at least some psychedelic analogues. Going forward, 
Figure 7 presents a, a large set of behavioral data supporting the idea of psychedelic induced plasticity in mice. In graph B, we can see that the tyrosine 433 mutation again abolishes the increase in LSD induced neurogenesis of dentate granule cells four weeks after a single administration. Graph D shows that volinanserin blocks the psychedelic associated head twitch response mediated through 5-HT2A receptors. However, it is important to note that there is no confirmation of receptor occupancy by the antagonist, and the head twitch response may not be particularly sensitive for demonstrating that all 5-HT2A activity is blocked. Moving forward, graph F shows data from repeated forced swim tests which is a test consisting of putting mice into a beaker filled with water they cannot escape. The decrease in immobility caused by LSD is interpreted as an antidepressant-like effect, indicating that the animals are still actively trying to escape the beaker instead of falling into a state of behavioral despair. Notably, the tyrosine 433 track B mutation abolishes this effect, suggesting a role of track B receptors in these behavioral outcomes. Furthermore, graph G demonstrates that the decrease in immobility is not blocked by the 5-HT2A antagonist volinanserin, again supporting the notion of a 5-HT2A independent mechanism. Now one small gripe I have with these figures is that they don't show the actual numerical values. Instead, they show relative values uh, where everything is normalized to the uh, baseline of the, the pretest, which is set to a 100%. This makes the data more difficult to interpret, as we can't really see what kind of differences exist in the different subgroups from baseline to treatment. Now, I'm not a statistician, but if you are, please, you know, leave a comment down below. Leave your thoughts. I think that there might be some uh, issues with making statistical comparisons between groups if the values are relative within each uh, pair. Moving on. The lower graphs demonstrate data from a fear conditioning experiment. Typically, in contextual fear conditioning, mice learn to associate a specific context, like a certain kind of box, with an unpleasant stimulus, such as a mild foot shock. This leads to the formation of a fear memory. After the conditioning, mice will freeze more upon being placed in the same context as they anticipate the aversive stimulus. During the extinction phase, mice will be placed in the same context but will not receive the aversive stimulus and they will begin to learn that it is safe. Here, the data proposes that LSD administered after fear conditioning facilitates extinction training and reduces contextual freezing at three days and at four weeks, while the track B mutation results in the loss of this effect. Graph K further shows that LSD doesn't do much by itself, but it needs to be combined with the extinction training to work. I cannot really comment on the intricacies of conducting fear conditioning experiments because I have little to no experience in doing these kinds of experiments. But if you are an expert of fear conditioning, feel free to leave a comment down below. That's pretty much my perspective of some of the key findings of this paper. Now obviously I skipped through a lot of data, so please check out the full publication for any uh, specific details and also check out the uh, data sets that I didn't uh, talk about at all. Now I'll try to summarize some of the main findings of this paper by using a, a working model uh, figure the, uh, the authors also published. As the authors propose, psychedelics bind to the transmembrane domain of track B receptors, facilitating receptor signaling and perhaps sensitizing the receptors to activation by BDNF. This then leads to further downstream cellular signaling and ultimately neural plasticity. 
This is very interesting since what they are proposing is essentially a completely novel mechanism for psychedelic induced plasticity. What I didn't really talk about was the potential role of cholesterol and lipid routes, but you can check out those findings in this paper and in other studies by the, the same authors. Now, as the author suggests, psychedelics are not direct track B agonists, but instead facilitate the actions of endogenous BDNF in synapses, kind of boosting physiological activity dependent plasticity. Through many experiments, the authors also demonstrate that the effects they observe do not rely on 5-HC2A receptors, which are the canonical receptor targets of all classical psychedelic drugs. In theory, this could mean that the psychedelic effects are separable from the plasticity promoting effects of these drugs, and I'm sure the pharmaceutical industry is going to be delighted. The data also suggests that psychedelics increase spinogenesis and dendritogenesis, in other words, the formation of neural structures crucial for communication between neurons, and that this happens in a track B dependent manner. Moreover, the data suggests that psychedelics also facilitate the long-term survival of newborn neurons in the hippocampus. Altogether, there is more and more preclinical evidence to support the idea that psychedelics do increase neural plasticity, at least in mice. But what to do with all of that plasticity? The authors suggest that these plasticity enhancing effects of psychedelics allow the activity dependent modification of neural networks following treatment, perhaps by promoting a state of a juvenile like plasticity, and that during this state of heightened plasticity, rewiring of neural networks is made possible. This idea is also supported by a recent study published in Nature, suggesting that psychedelics can reopen a critical period for social reward learning in adult mice. The clinical significance of these findings remains somewhat unclear, but such mechanisms could, for example, explain the benefits of psychedelic drugs in treating psychiatric disorders, particularly when given in a therapeutic context. It could also be that in many cases, you know, the psychedelic experience itself is the therapeutic context. Now, before you get all excited about psychedelics being the super plasticity promoting drugs that will change your brain for the better, um, I just need to emphasize that much remains to be known about the plasticity promoting effects of psychedelics, particularly in the human brain. But this and other studies do suggest that psychedelics seem to be facilitating mechanisms of plasticity, at least in the brains of rodents. Whether these mechanisms are truly you know, 5-HT2A dependent or track B dependent remains somewhat unclear to me at this stage. Uh, it's, it's, it's more likely that the plasticity promoting effects recruit a lot of mechanisms and are essentially more complex than uh, being mediated by a single receptor. Future studies replicating these findings and also some of the other studies of psychedelic induced plasticity will be a key step forward to truly understanding how psychedelics act in the brain. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing where the field is going to move in, in the future. That's pretty much all for today. Let me know your thoughts by leaving a comment down below. And also, please remember to press like and subscribe to my channel for future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching and until next time.